Hello there, Maple. Um, to my calculations, this should be Tuesday uh, for your chapter 75. Um, so off we go. Well, obviously I do sleep because I wake up under Pi's Doctor Who duvet cover. Everything, my clothes, my bag, has been tidied up from where I left it on the floor. There's an old-fashioned digital clock on the dresser that says 14.02. I have slept for nearly 12 hours straight and still don't feel exactly fresh as a daisy, but I get up nonetheless. There's a desk in the room and on it is a cardboard box with low sides containing a saucer of water and some muesli and some torn up newspaper with Alan Shearer curled up all cosy underneath it, all of which Grandpa Byron has done while I've been asleep. It comes back to me hazily, me waking up in the night and seeing Grandpa Byron sitting on my bed. It was dawn, but his eyes were glistening in the bluish light that came through the very thin curtains, and I could tell he'd been crying. I turned on my pillow and gave him a sleepy smile. Oh, Pi son, he murmured. Oh, how I've missed you. I was about to say, I'm not Pi, I'm Al. But I found, as I opened my mouth to speak, I didn't have the heart to spoil his dawn daydream. Instead, I said, I'm tired, tired, and I rolled over back to sleep. On a chair is a set of clothes, but they're not new, and I know straight away that they are pies, including the shiny blue bomber jacket that he had on the first time I met him. When I put them on, they smell like they have been in a drawer for ages. I carry my hamster and his box downstairs to the kitchen where Grandpa Byron is tapping at the keyboard of a laptop. In front of him on the breakfast bar is the framed photo of me, my dad and my mum, which he must have taken from my backpack while I was asleep. As I walk in and see this, his hand defensively lowers the screen of, of, of the laptop a little, prompting me to ask, what are you doing? Instead of answering me directly, he looks at me with a sad sort of smile, standing there looking exactly like Pi, wearing his clothes and everything. He gets up and goes to the front door. I need to tell you something, he says, as he pulls on a pair of wellies and tucks his jeans into them, indicating a pair for me to put on too. Outside, he's walking fast towards the beach, and I have to almost jog to keep up with him. And then we're on the seafront on the big grassy headland that has the double bay of Culvercott on one side and the yellow-white stretch of beach towards Timber on the other. There's a long sandy stairway down to the beach and before we get to the bottom, Grandpa Byron has already told me that he was up all night on the internet. There's a cool fret in the air and it makes me shiver a bit, but I don't care because I'm listening to the story he told me. It was 1994, almost 10 years after Pi had died, except this day was warm. One of those days in the northeast in early summer when the fog has been burnt away by a hot sun and there was a queue, the first of the year, outside the Colbercott fish and chip shop. The sea was calm enough in the bay where it was sheltered by the two curved piers that rang the headland on the long beach the, the, the waves sorry, were beating the sand hard. Not many people were swimming. Further along towards Tynmouth, the warning flags were up, but there were no lifeguards this early in the season, and even the surfers, who I've seen out there in the winter, had just given up. On the first Saturday in June for the past few years, the Indians who lived in and around Colvercott, mainly Punjabis, and there still weren't many of them in 1994, had met for a beach party. There was Turban Guy, whose real name was Baru Bakshi, whose beachwear was an old brown suit and a sleeveless jumper and a tie. His tiny round wife in a sari was struggling through the soft sand with a cooler box. There was Tarun from the shop, now married to a woman from Armristar, via Middlesbrough, who was in jeans and a t-shirt, and their little girl in a yellow dress decorated with Indian-style sequins. There were others as well, maybe a dozen or so, and there was Hypatia, nearly 15, 
and of course, Grandpa Byron. Your turn this year, Byron, said Barry Bakshi, handing in a ceremonial garland of orange and yellow marigolds strung together in a long loop. I thought Sikhs and Hindus had different ceremonies, I asked Grandpa Byron when he was telling me this. By now we had crossed the dry sand and were walking along the edge of the long, gentle ways. So they do, bonny lad, so they do. But we don't mind mixing it up now and then. This was more of a social thing anyway. And besides, I'm not that much of a Hindu, to be honest. In Baru's a pretty free-thinking Sikh. Now, let's get on with the story. And so Grandpa Byron walked down to the water's edge. Pretty much exactly here, he said. Maple, I'm just going to pull my blinds a minute. One of it bright. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. That's a bit better. Right, where are we? Da, 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 da. Oh, yes. Pretty much exactly here, he said, looking up and down the beach, followed by most of the others new to a group of young women in their teens and twenties, wearing swimsuits who had been playing in the shallows. Baru Bakshi's wife had been around the group, giving everyone the red forehead dot, the bindi, with her fingertip and red paste, and they stood there knee-deep in the water. Baru Bakshi had rolled his suit trousers up. The ladies' wet saris clung to their legs. Grandpa Byron drew his arm back and flung the garland into the waves, and then there was a shout from further out in the sea. The group of girls were pointing to a young woman, who was not that far away from the shore, still not even out of her depth, struggling against the backdrop of a retreating wave, pushing the water aside with her arms to try and stay upright. And then her head disappeared under the water as another wave began its build-up. Sarah, Sarah, swim, screamed one young woman on the shore when she saw the head reappear. And she started to go into the water before being pulled back by a friend no, Ava, no, you can't. But already Grandpa Byron was undressing and striding naked into the sea before diving under the next wave and driving his strong arms, one after the other, into the water, getting closer and closer to the drowning woman. As he reached her, her head went under again and Grandpa Byron, still just able to stand, but knocked and buffeted by the rock uh, rocking sea, duck dived beneath the surface at exactly the moment that the waves settled between surges. In the lull, the only sound was the group of girls wailing, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God! as they held their hands prayer-like in front of their mouths, and Apatia shaking her head and saying slowly, Oh my goodness. There was no sight of them for about ten seconds. One of the girls started crying and another had flipped open a big old mobile phone and was calling 999. 20 seconds, Al. It doesn't sound like long, but, but try counting it. It's an age if you're waiting for someone to reappear from under the water. At this point, Grandpa Byron stopped telling me the story, realising what he had said. He looked down. I know, I said. But no more words came out because I think I knew where this story was headed and my mouth was dry with fear and nerves and... And then someone shouted, Look, over there! About 30 minutes, uh, metres down the beach, struggling out of the waves was Grandpa Byron, holding up the girl who kept stumbling over in the waves. When they got to waist deep, she convulsed and threw up a belly full of seawater then Grandpa Byron bent down, gently scooped her up and carried her out of the sea towards them. He set her down on the dry part of the sand and her friends gathered round her. Grandpa Byron stood to one side, hands on his hips, face lifted to the sky, panting and spitting out salty water. And then the girl's attention turned to him. Baru Bakshi cycled up. Well done, Byron! But I am thinking you might want to uh, put your pants on. I think Grandpa Byron has told this story before. Honestly, he paused with a comedian sense of timing before he said that last bit and then looked at me, waiting for me to laugh. I was not really in a laughing mood, but I managed to force out a little noise so he could continue. 
I climbed into my pants and stood smiling at the girl I had just saved as she wiped a, a stream of snizzle from her nose and smiled back at me. And then she was spreading her feet out in the sand, showing that two of her toes on each foot were fused together. And she told me her name was Sarah. We stayed there for a while on the sand, the two of us, letting the waves lick around our wellies. Sarah. Mum, she's alive. A boy needs his mum, says Grandpa Byron, with a kind of finality. And we're going to find her. Oh, that's a good place to stop, Mabel, isn't it? That was rather exciting, actually, wasn't it? Grandpa Byron was a hero, to say the least. So, I hope you enjoyed that. We've only got a few little chapters left, which I will work out between now and the end of next week, because then we're back at school. So, I hope you enjoyed that, and um, tune in again tomorrow. Okay then, Maple. Take care. Bye. Bye.